This is the cultural adaptation of a semi-palatial system at Mocarta, Sicily. I'm Justin Singleton. William F. Albright recognized biblical archaeology extending as far west as Spain, but little has been done west of Cyprus with this in the biblical archaeology circles, and little has been done within Asor specifically. As a matter of fact, broader Mediterranean archaeology has, for the most part, been separated from that of the archaeology of the Levant, except when studying Mycenaean and other Aegean influences and later Roman archaeology associated with the travels of the apostles. In a broad way, this paper will touch on some of the associations with the Levant without deeply speaking of the Levant. Instead, this paper will serve as a bridge between Aegean influence with its east and its west, seeing a semi-palatial system adapted from Mycenaean influence even in inland western Sicily at a time when a semi-palatial system was being adapted in the Levant, namely 950 BC. The story of human evolution is, as expected, a story of change. When one culture interacts with the other, even if in battle, those two cultures begin to infiltrate one another, though often on a subconscious level. This is true of Israel and her neighbors, and is true of the lone city of Mokarta, deep inside the inland mountains of western Sicily. Now, we know Mokarta by its one occupation ruins it's left behind, ignoring for a moment the medieval castle on the edge of the hilltop. Uh, Mokarta being destroyed by conquest around 950 BC. A few hundred years later, we have well understood Elamean occupation in the area. <coughs> Excuse me. But no one ever resettled the Makarta hilltop. Uh, the Elamians, one of the three main people groups of ancient Sicily, moved their way into western Sicily and ultimately became the dominant culture, trading with, fighting with, and even befriending the Phoenicians. It's believed that these Elamians were responsible for the destruction of Makarta, or perhaps we can call them the proto elimi as the culture of these people is difficult to ascertain before the 7th century BC. Whoever it was that destroyed Mokarta, they left behind uh, a wealth of information for archaeologists today. Not including the stone-cut burial chambers, three bodies were discovered at the site, one being a young woman who appears to have been attempting to flee her hut. She is still holding a pot in her hand. This destruction has, uh, uh, as with most destructions, buried pottery, spindle whorls, and as noted before, even bodies in place that have been left for archaeologists to find more than 3,000 years later. The lack of further occupation makes Makarta an ideal site for understanding the culture that died out so long ago. But for our purpose here, what's important is, of course, the discovery of a somewhat complex semi-palatial system. Now, before an examination, though, of a, a, a brief history of historical information gathered in Sicily will be given. It might be a little cliche to say that in Sicily, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. During the late Bronze Age of Italy, Iron One in the Levant, there was a socioeconomic move from a tribal society to a gentilicial one, creating an aristocracy that sought fortifications based on Mycenaean palace models. Complex trade with the Aegean took place, just as in mainland Italy, so this same socioeconomic move took place on the island. As interactions with other cultures grew, so eastern Sicily became a place where goods and ideas were spread. By the Middle Bronze Age, pottery, metal, and ornamental items imported from Greece, Aegean, and Cyprus, or resembling contem contemporary forms in these regions, as well as in Italy and Malta, attest the existence of networks that permitted a diversity of goods to flow in greater quantities. Uh, at Thapsos, uh, one of the harbor sites in eastern Sicily, 28 Mycenaean late Helladic 3A through B pottery examples have been found at Lipari. 30 have been discovered with lesser amounts at surrounding sites. In addition to the pottery at Thapsos, a number of Tholos tombs have been discovered, showing either a Mycenaean presence at the site or, more likely, cultural assimilation of Aegean influence by those 
at Thapsos. In all, Mycenaean trade intensified the growth of palace economies, and by the middle of the second millennium BC, Sicily became a bridge between east and west. As local economies grew, communities began to develop into proto-urban centers. These sites, including some inland sites, had a strong Aegean influence, both in material and architectural production, and also in a sphere of socioeconomic organization. By the 12th century BC, Aegean contact began to decrease, and as the harbor sites, living a decadent lifestyle, had become dependent upon the trade, they waned in power, and the more inland sites, such as Pantilica, became their successors. These inland sites, though influenced by their coastal neighbors, had become semi-autonomous in that their survival did not depend on the outside world. Even with their semi-autonomous economic systems, though, the social systems introduced by the Aegean continued to pervade the island as the emerging elites were able to exercise control of the hillside agro-pastoral economies. Thus, proto-urban models of organization uh, began to form based on the Aegean palatial model in which they become familiar. While no palaces have been discovered, at Pantilica, an island mountaintop city in eastern city, uh, excuse me, in eastern Sicily, uh, a building that some have speculated be a palace-type structure was discovered. Uh, because of the lack of clear stratigraphy and for other reasons, it, it, it cannot be said with certainty that what we have at Pantilica dates to the period in question. But if it does, it would be the sole palace-type building on the island at this time. That said, it isn't the palace structures that lead us to believe that a semi-palatial system exists in Sicily, but the social structure. <clears throat> According to Speciana Tusa, the secret of Pantilica's endurance in the centuries between the second and the first millennium BC, which we also happen, uh, uh, which also happens specularly in in Mocarta, albeit over a more limited period of time and with different dynamics, uh, must be sought in the solidity of its socioeconomic structure and in the successful ecosystem relationship with the surrounding environment, which allowed its inhabitants to live and prosper for a long time without any contributions from outside. In essence, it was this inland mountaintop site's autonomous nature that allowed it to become the prominent site in the east after the Aegean presence had poured out of the island. Moving to the west, it was during the Middle and Late Bronze Age, that three cultural facies emerged. Those closely assimilated to the Thapsos Malazzo civilization, with prominent sites such as Ustica and Irbe Bianca, the internal facies closely matching the Pantilica and Casible civilizations, with its hegemonic center at Mokarta, and finally that of the Asonian type, which is not well defined. As this paper deals specifically with Mokarta, the first and last of these fasces will be avoided. At Mocarda, as well as Stretto, Tempona, Pantilo, uh, San Ciro, and Finestrella, it's possible to identify a rich collection of samples of burial architecture, excuse me, burial architecture types and relative grave goods very similar to that of Pantilica, following its formal features and typologies. This rather large city of Mocarta, located inland and on a mountaintop like Pantilica, seems to have played the same role as Pantilica, that is, a large proto-urban center. Thus, perhaps this, this facies can be called the pantilica Mocarta civilization, one in the east and the other in the west. The entire plateau on the Mocarta mountaintop extends to approximately 108 hectares, of Sicanian ethos, Mokarta controlled a vast, fertile, and flat territory, as well as one of the main roads in western Sicily. Its hegemonic character leads it to be of importance to the study of the emergence of chiefdoms in western Sicily. It was destroyed around 950 BC by who might be called the proto Lemi, as noted above. Although the site itself was destroyed in the 10th century, its strategic character can be felt from its founding in the 13th century down into the 4th century, being adopted by the later Elameans, of whose ancestors were most likely the destroyers of the city. The socioeconomic semi-palatial system uh, can be 
seen in the design of the city itself. As stated above, there were no palaces at this time on the island. That's why the, these are deemed semi-palatial. Even though no palaces can be found, there, there was what seems to be a gentilicial aristocracy. It should be noted that although the Okarda mountaintop plateau is quite large, only a portion of the city has been excavated, with excavations still continuing. From what has been excavated, Tusa, the primary investigator and site director, has done a tremendous job uh, showing social sections within the city. Now, there are seven sections within the excavated area, uh, with anywhere from one to three circular huts and any number of quadrangular spaces. The circular huts are reminiscent of other huts found around the island, but these in Mokarta and some others on the island contain a double entryway or forceps entry. These double entryways are undoubtedly to keep the cold winter mountain winds from putting out the central fires used in everyday cooking. Beyond the design of the perfectly circular huts, the sections themselves are quite interesting, showing a sense of social structure. Although only two sections, sections A and D, can be said to be completely investigated with all their spaces included, uh, further excavation needs to be done to discover the remaining huts on the outskirts of the excavated area. What we learn about these residential sections by the objects inside each of the known huts has led excavators to believe that there was indeed a social plan for the layout of the city. Area H, not listed as a se separate section by the site director but done so here for continuity, is located southwest of the main excavated area and just below the medieval castle. It was accidentally uh, discovered when excavations of the castle were underway, and inside the single hut, Hut 10, two bronze axe head molds were discovered, leading the team to believe that uh, this was an uh, area designated for metallurgical work. Uh, no other molds have been discovered to date. The, the set-apart nature of this metallurgical section compares to contemporary settlements of Sabachina and possibly Pantilica. Now, working alphabetically now, Area A is located in the center of the main excavated city and is one of the two complete sections containing one hut, Hut 2, and two quadrangular spaces, 2A and 2B. Area A contained 47% of all androns and 75% of all bone awls. Uh, while spindles are found in nine of the 14 huts, there appears to be a predominance of spindles in Area A. Additionally, one-third of all pottery was found here, with the majority in the open space, though there is a large number in Hut 2 and Quadrangular Space 2A. This has led the investigators to believe that Mokarta Area A was linked with both weaving and pottery production. Now, no kiln has yet been discovered, which means that it's possible that one of the quadrangular spaces in Area A was used for storage of pottery after firing. Area B contains two circular huts, Hut 1 and Hut 6, as well as two quadrangular spaces. One rather interesting and yet unexplained piece of ceramic uh, found at Mokarta and neighboring sites is the fictile horn. Almost half of the 17 horns are in area B, with 29% of the whole number inside hut 6. Area A, used for storage, comes in second place. Uh, interestingly, uh, only one spindle was found inside hut 6. Uh, area B also includes one of the three so-called incense burners, a ceremonial vessel of unknown usage, uh, found at the site and on the opposite side of the uh, excavated area from another ceremonial vessel to be described below. Um, the greatest number of millstones comes from Area C. Now, Area C contains two circular huts, Hut 7 and 13, one of which has an added room attached to the back of the hut, which is Hut 7. Every section in the known excavation contains two or more millstones, but Area C contains 22, all inside the huts. 
with areas A and B containing 17 each, mainly inside the quadrangular spaces. <coughs> Excuse me. Area D contains three circular huts, huts 8, 9, and 11. And it's this area that is also clearly defined. Two bronze objects, insignificant in size, are located in hut 9 and hut 8, an arrowhead and a nail. Area D is one of the two richest areas in terms of objects, though the richest hut itself is located in area E. Uh, from the objects, it seems the activities in D included spinning and feasting. Two of the six high-pedestaled fluted basins are found in hut 9 of area D. Uh, it's in area E, adjacent to D as stated above, that the other two, uh, uh, excuse me, that the other high pedestaled uh, fluted basins can be found. Interestingly enough, this is on the opposite end of the excavated area where the so called incense burners are found. Uh, area E contains huts 12 and 14. In addition to the fluted basins, hut 14 is the richest of the entire excavated site, including two fictile horns, 10 spindles, five miniature vases, and pots for preserving food. It appears in that the richness of the site is gathered into this northern sector of areas D and E. Areas F and G, including huts 3, 4, and 5, are still under review. With the different social sections within the city, and with the richness of the feasting sector, it can be said that the social structure was one of a gentilicial hierarchy or an aristocracy, as is seen within the palatial system spread around the Mediterranean. Of course, uh, with no palace, this cannot truly be said to be a palatial, but a semi-palatial system. Uh, in this case, spread from the Mycenaean Aegean influence in the east, in the coastal port cities, to the inland cities with the collapse of the Aegean trade, and ultimately to the west of the island. As I said in the beginning, the story of human evolution is a story of change. When one culture interacts with another, these two cultures begin to infiltrate one another, leading to an often better form of living. This is true of Israel and her neighbors after the collapse of the Mycenaean palatial system, and is true of Sicily and the lone city of Mokarda, deep inside the Western Mountains.